Zanz Africa Kamalam Dingo Siviwa Kwahube, the DA's national spokesperson. Namkele Kile Nonke to the inside track. This week we bring you insight from the inside on whether given COVID-19 resurgence, South Africa needs to implement lockdown measures again. But if not a lockdown, then what can be done? What can we do to save both lives and livelihoods? Please like this video, share with your friends and family, and please subscribe to our page and our channel. But first, let's take a look at the week in headlines. the big story at this hour. The ATM party will formally ask the Speaker of the National Assembly to postpone its no-confidence motion against President Cyril Ramaphosa. Provincial councillor and political heavyweight Andile Lungisa has been found guilty of the intention to do grievous bodily harm. Andile Lungisa has been released on parole. This after just two months of his three-year sentence. Now the ANC Zimbabwe trip has caused much controversy. This came after members took a trip in a South African Defence Force plane. Social media erupted with criticism and scrutiny over the use of a state aircraft. Blatant and arrogant abuse of South Africa's military by the ANC. If the photographs are photographs of Judge Desai attending an ANC branch meeting, of course, into question his ability to be objective. The fence between South Africa and Zimbabwe was erected in March to help curb the spread of COVID-19, but its procurement and construction were questionable. The body of 80-year-old Boza Nakomalo was found tied to a tree after he went to check on the family's cattle and sheep. The main news of this week was definitely the motion of no confidence in President Cyril Ramaphosa, which was a complete non-starter. It was and continues to be nothing but internal ANC factional battles playing themselves out on the floor of Parliament. The ATM, in our view, is just a proxy for the Zuma Mahashula camp in the ANC and we do not intend to take part in the factional infighting. And while we respect any party's right to move a motion of not confidence, this was a waste of Parliament's programming time which needs to urgently consider budget recommendation reports. And so we, have, we will decide to abstain from this vote, even when it comes to Parliament next year. The matter of whether or not it will be a secret ballot is now the matter between the ATM, the Mahashule faction, the Speaker of the National Assembly and the Western Cape High Court. But I want to make this clear. Our abstinence from this vote isn't a vote for President Ramaphosa. It is our refusal to be drawn into a messy battle brewing in the ANC. We will continue to hold President Ramaphosa and his government to account using parliamentary and legal processes, especially given his complete failure to manage the economy and forcing millions more to join the unemployment queue. Moving on to safety issues which came up this week, our borders are an utter mess. They have been for a while, and that's why the DA has called on the Minister of Defence to prioritise border security urgently. The Bait Bridge border fence, which South cost the South African taxpayer 40 million rand, is barely standing, while there are still lingering questions about the awarding of the tender. And in more tragic news this week, in the wake of the brutal murder of 80-year-old farmer Mr. Mboza Makumalo in KZN, the DA's DA Kalabanad has written to 10 of the top human rights agencies in the world asking that they may place pressure on the ANC government, which continues to ignore the plight of South Africans in rural areas. Rural safety is a huge problem in our country. And the fact that there's consistent under-resourcing of the substance in rural areas and is an indictment on our government. And in more shocking news, the independence of Judge Siraj Desai has come into question. Disturbing photographs surfaced on social media last week of the Western Cape High Court Judge Desai having a powwow with the ANC ahead of a by-election. Our constitution is clear. It says the courts are independent and only subject to the constitution and the law, and they must be applied impartially without fear or favor. What then this means is that one of our high court judges has effectively given a middle finger to the constitution. 
This is why the DA's advocate, Glennis Breitenbach, has written to Chief Justice requesting an inquiry into this matter. But the story doesn't even end there. After the DA released a statement to this effect on Tuesday, independent media did a write-up of that story and published it on their website, the IOL, that very afternoon. The next morning, however, this article was promptly removed from their site. It's clear that it has been censored. It's common knowledge that independent media is anything but independent. But this act of censorship goes against our fundamental constitutional issues, which is an independent media and an impartial judiciary. And this is why we do not intend on letting this matter go. And moving on to it by the notorious jug wielding Mpokoko eating criminal counselor from NMB, Andile Lungisa, walked out of prison only having served two of his two years, two months of his two year sentence for assaulting a fellow counselor, Reina Kaiser, by breaking a jug over his head. Lungisa's release seems extremely irregular and makes a mockery of our justice system. It can't be that there's one set of laws for ordinary citizens and another for people who are politically connected to the ANC. Longisa was an integral part of the ANC-led coalition of corruption government, which brought the Nelson Mandela Bay to its knees. And it is only fair that he serves his time. And that's why the DA's James Self has posed questions to the Portfolio Committee on Correctional Services in this regard. What has now been termed Jetgate is a bombshell. A few months ago, the ANC and a Minister of Defence, Nosivua Mapisa Ngakula, broke the law by sending a party delegation to Zimbabwe using state funds and state resources. This became known as Jetgate. This was over and above the fact that this trip happened under level two lockdown when international travel was strictly prohibited. It has now emerged that there are no official mi minutes of this meeting, which supposedly took place between Mapisa Ngakula and her Zimbabwean counterpart. And there are real questions about whether or not this even took place. The DA learned this through a prior application and affidavit by Ambassador Gladys Kujo, the Secretary of Defense. And it confirms that no minutes exist of the supposed meeting between Minister Ngakula and her Zimbabwean Minister of, Sub of Defense. Did the ANC and the Minister of Defense take a joyride using military aircraft during a lockdown, during a pandemic for an imaginary meeting? And so now we're looking at issues in Gauteng. On Wednesday, Gauteng Premier David Makura reshuffled his cabinet, announcing Nomatemba Mocheti as the new MEC for health. Mocheti needs to really hit the ground running to confront this ongoing COVID-19 crisis in the province. Gauteng accounts for a large number of new infections that we are seeing daily. And more concerningly, there are questions about the veracity of the COVID-19 figures that come from the province. You cannot fight a pandemic if you do not know what you are fighting and what the true extent of the problem is. And lastly, in more positive news, yesterday the amendment to the Municipal Systems Act was passed by the National Assembly. This act will prohibit all municipal officials from being office bearers of political parties. This is a huge blow against cadre deployment and the DA is very glad to have been significantly influencing the clauses of this act. However, we're under no illusion that cadre deployment and jobs for pals will end overnight, but this is certainly a step in the right direction and long may it continue and it's may it set the president precedent for the same to be done throughout the public service. And now moving on to the spotlight feature of this episode. Last night, President Cyril Ramaphosa addressed the nation on measures to address COVID-19 resurgence in South Africa. And I'll be joined in studio by the Premier of the Western Cape, Alan Windy. But before that, let's take a look at the story in the spotlight. There has been a spike in the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in South Africa. South Africa is monitoring its COVID-19 hotspot areas, raising concerns about rising figures, especially in the Eastern Cape. The numbers are increasing, but largely driven from 
one province and that is the Eastern Cape. The province is officially experiencing a second wave of COVID-19. The Western Cape issued a hotspot alert for the garden route following an alarming increase of cases. New infections are as a result of people not adhering to safety and prevention protocols. Government is discussing placing further restrictions ahead of the festive season to help slow down the spread of the coronavirus. Law enforcement authorities are also readying themselves to intensify spot checks and clamp down on irresponsible behavior. Several countries around the world are already experiencing that second wave, or the province of the Western Cape says it's readying itself for this eventuality. It's the debate about economy versus lives. Our economy cannot afford uh, another lockdown, so we have to bring in whatever measures we have. Everything that we do is to make sure that our hospitals are managing. The question today is whether or not South Africa can afford another hard lockdown as we head into the festive season. And so I've got in the studio with me the Premier of the Western Cape, Alan Windy. Alan, I know you're a busy man. Thank you so much for joining us in the studio. Asif, it's really great to be with you, especially on this great new platform. Thank you very much. Cool. Alan, we, in this segment, we're going to be unpacking the, the devastating effects of any form of lockdown. The DA has been quite clear that our real intention here is to balance the, the saving lives and livelihoods. And we want to ensure that our, our view is quite clear, that we are not in support of a hard lockdown. We want to ensure that we explore what other ways they are in order for us to essentially be able to save an economy, to save jobs, to save lives in effect, um, so that people don't go poor, while at the same time saving lives in terms of ensuring that um, we ready the health system so that people can be able to get the help that they need. And so, Alan, the president announced a number of measures yesterday. He was very harsh in saying that people need to take accountability and personal responsibility, which is absolutely apt. And, and he's announced a number of restrictions which are going to be um, you know, laid out in, in Nelson Mandela Bay. What is your view on some of the things that were announced yesterday? So, of course, uh, you know, at the moment we are seeing our numbers uh, in the garden route uh, going up. Um, and of course, what we noticed is the further restrictions now for Nelson Mandela Bay. We are saying in the province that uh, we don't need further restrictions. Under level one, we, we are happy with that as the, as the restriction. Um, what we need to do is get the behavioral change right. Uh, we need to make sure that that balance remains in place. Further restrictions just cut jobs, just uh, destroy your economy. And of course, it is that balance. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so what we're doing is we, we've shown all along, we used the first initial lockdown, get your health response right. Have you got those extra beds in place? Are you able to deal with the consequences of the virus? Mm. Make sure you've got a proper monitoring system. Uh, we put a dashboard in place that's won now two awards uh, for the data that comes out on that dashboard. Mm. Uh, good. Quality data is what you need. Mm. Sometimes people ask me, why is there a difference sometimes between national data and provincial data? Well, we spend a lot of time making sure that our data is cleaned up. Mm. Uh, the data we put out is effective and, and uh, efficient and on time and correct. Mm. Uh, you know, that's the most important thing because then people can make decisions based on the data that mm. you'll see. Mm. And then let's get the economy up and running. We've lost far too many jobs. We've got to get the recovery going. So our health response is there. We monitor every day. Uh, we've got a team in the garden read at the moment, you know, making sure that we're slowing the virus down, uh, getting, getting uh, citizens to play their part. Yeah. It's about behavioral change, you know, yeah. and people, lockdowns take away people's freedom. People want their freedom. Freedom comes at a price. That price is a responsibility. Yeah. Um, and we need to get that responsibility in place. Let's make sure we all know what to do. Mm -hmm. Let's keep it down so we can allow the economy yeah. to run. And Ellen, a lot of people um, are under the impression that a lockdown is actually was actually always meant to somehow eradicate the virus. But I mean, we know that lockdowns are uh, an emergency measure to slow down the spread, to buy you time to be able to get your health system ready. And I mean, so, I mean, what are some, I mean, we, we did quite a bit in the, in the province to be able to try and get our system ready so that we can deal with the peak. Absolutely, that was what we used the lockdown for. 
Uh, and on top of that, you know, once you've got your health system ready, you also need to learn. Remember that the world is learning, so we must learn from other parts of the world, but we learned ourselves. Mm. You know, we put innovation in place. We, we narrowed down the risk. If you were a, you know, a citizen with a, a comorbidity issue like diabetes, the comorbidity of diabetes was the most harshly hit mm -hmm. in our province. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a look at how we learned to deal with people with that comorbidity, your risks now when you get into our hospital are way lower than they were uh, eight months ago. Mm -hmm. We've learned. We, we put the space in place. Uh, I mean, we really went uh, above and beyond making sure that we had that extra capacity in beds um, and of course, when we flattened the curve, we could remove some of them, but we've kept many of them in place yeah. because you know we're learning. We, we're making sure that we are getting that balance right. Mm. You've got to get recovery going that you still at the same time got your health response in mm. place, efficient and able to deal with uh, any any surge, resurgence, etc. Yeah. And I mean, I, I suppose, you know, the president focused a lot on NMB yesterday because part of the reason why NMB is in the kind of precarious position that they're in right now is because actually the health system is near collapsing. And so you've got a situation where hospitals are completely chock-a-block full, that people don't have beds, people are fighting over oxygen. And so that's something that we've managed to, man to manage in the province mm. where, you know, as you say, there are some facilities, extra facilities that we have in place. So bear in mind that, of course, we are managing it. I can mm. tell you right now that uh, our hospitalization in the garden route of COVID-19 patients is much higher than anywhere else in our province. Mm. Uh, we're sitting at 79% occupancy in total in our hospitals across the province. 9% mm. uh, is the take up of uh, the hospital beds with people with COVID-19 in the in the city mm. and in the region of the province, but in the garden route that's up to 15%. So you can see that you can see that there is an increase in numbers there. Yesterday we used 2.8 tons of oxygen on looking after those patients in our hospital system. We know what's happening, but of course we've got to monitor those numbers because as if, if citizens don't play their part in slowing down the spread of the virus, then what happens is we start taking hospital beds away from other needs, mm. cancer treatments mm. or TB, which is a big thing that, that uh, I want to focus on in this province. Mm. You know, we, we need to be able to focus on the issues that are actually, uh, you know, really putting our citizens under, under pressure. Yeah. And Ellen, um, you know, so a lot of people, you know, have been saying on, on social media, you know, do we cancel our holiday? Should we go to the Western Cape? A lot of people are unable to travel abroad and, you know, we obviously need the local tourism. And, and what do you say to people who say we are unsure, you know, are we... So so I'm saying to you, if you want to go uh, away this holiday to a hotspot area, an mm. area where we're seeing the numbers going up, you can check it on dashboard and for, let's talk about the garden route. We're saying you're welcome. Mm. Just understand one thing. You must come and enjoy our province. You must come and enjoy our towns. Mm. Uh, you must be part of the solution and not part of the problem. So that means your holiday will be a bit different. You're mm. not going to come to the garden route and end up, you know, crowding into restaurants, crowding into spaces that cause the spread. We all know what it is. So mm. remember the social distancing, remember the masks, remember the sanitizer. Uh, and your holiday is going to be a real holiday. You're mm. not going to have these big, uh, you know, these big gatherings. Mm. Um, and we are relying on citizens to play their part. We'll play our part. It's a deal. You know, mm. we'll play our part as government. Mm. Citizens play their part. We get through this together. Mm. Um, we will also bring in law enforcement where we need to. Mm. But in actual fact, it's the last thing that I want to do. Mm. Uh, I want to actually say, listen, this partnership of citizen and government, if we get that right, we flatten the curve and we have a good holiday. Mm -hmm. And Ellen, on, on, on the issue around, around hard lockdowns, I mean, we've seen around the world, you know, there's still, the jury's still out. A lot of people say, you know, hard lockdown really, really works. Other people say no lockdowns at all. And obviously in the country, we've all agreed that it's now a, a proper balance between lives and livelihoods. Although one may argue that obviously, you know, when you shut down an entire economy, lives can be lost as well. What would a, a lockdown mean for the Western Cape? And why, why have you been on record saying it would be devastating? So... The initial lockdown, I mean, this is, this is about evidence. We believe in evidence, science. The initial lockdown gave us that time to set up the hospital response that we needed, mm. made sure we got that extra oxygen in place. Mm. Uh, made sure, you know, that, that was what the lockdown did for us. It gave us that reprieve. 
But what the lockdown also did was it devastated our economy. Mm. Um, I mean, listen, that's the last thing that South Africa needed. Uh, you know, our unemployment, what is our real unemployment rate? Mm. You know, not the numbers that we see. What mm. are our real, I mean, half of the working force of our nation are not in jobs, more than half. Mm. I mean, this is really devastating and it's got worse. In actual fact, if you look at the Gini coefficient, the Gini coefficient has got worse because of the lockdown. Mm. Poverty, um, if you look at the indicators, um, in actual fact, Rural women mm. are now so much uh, uh, more badly off now post the lockdown mm. than ever before. We mm. already knew this is a focus area that we need to work on to actually make sure that we give opportunity. Mm. Um, and so that has been, you know, and it's about the balance. So yes, we got our health response right, but at the end of this day, there's massive dev mm. devastation. So we are saying, We've got it now. We, we know how to put out a bushfire. Absolutely. We've got the health response in place. We are able to deal with it through behavioral change. We are able to deal with it with our existing um, you know, systems that we've got in place. So a, a, a lockdown will just exacerbate that devastation that's already created. Mm -hmm. We cannot afford that. Mm -hmm. So we have to find other ways and that's exactly what we are doing. So uh, you know, obviously that's the plan that we are putting on the table mm -hmm. um, to the, the National Command Council to say, this is what the Western Cape is doing. This is how we're doing it. We've proven it over the last few weeks. Of course, what's happening in the Garden Route is bigger now than what happened in Beaufort West or in the southern suburbs of the city or the northern suburbs of the city. In those different regions, every time we saw a bushfire, we cooled it down. Yeah. Now, this is a bigger one. We've still got to cool it down. Yeah. At the same time, enabling jobs, enabling uh, uh, the recovery, because we have to recover from this, to... uh, from this. We have to recover from the lockdown. Yeah. We have to recover from COVID-19 while still fighting it. Mm, absolutely. So we got a comment because we invite people to um, essentially speak to us on the show because it's about interacting with you. We want to hear from you. And so continue sending us your comments. And we got a comment, um, a question from Alexander Dowding, who was asking, when is a vaccine going to be rolled out in South Africa? And this is a very good question um, because this is something that is not being really thrashed out in the, in the discourse about COVID-19 at the moment because we saw this week reports that indicate that government has been, has missed the deadline for being one of the first countries to be able to enter into this COVAX um, uh, uh, process so that we may be able to procure a vaccine quickly and, and as quickly as possible. The reality is that lockdowns are not a way to eradicate COVID-19. We've got to find ways, and I'm going to ask Alan now, what some of the innovative ways that the Western Cape has tried to fight this, this pandemic but lockdowns are not the way to fight a pandemic. They are there to slow down the spread so you can build capacity. But at the same time, there is a real concern that our South African government has a bit of a short-termism in dealing with this pandemic. We need to look at longer-term strategies on how do we change behaviors? How do we put out bushfires, like Alan has said? But also, where is our vaccine plan? And so this is some of the questions that we've been asking in Parliament. I've been asking this question to Minister Mkise. I've been asking this question and I was hoping that the president last night actually was going to provide some clarity. But he gave a throwaway line that says, you know, this is a process that is ongoing. And the reality is that we're not seeing a comprehensive plan on when is this going to be procured? How will it be distributed? Will there be a priority of healthcare workers who are frontline workers, the most vulnerable, and that plan? So that we can see, as we can see other countries starting to get involved, we want to see our country start getting involved with, um, with, with, this, with this vaccine. But Alan, other alternatives? Um, and I know that this week you launched your three-point plan. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. So maybe, I mean, I noticed yesterday that uh, it seems like we missed our down payment on the yes, vaccine. Yeah. I mean, cheapest. How do you how do you do that? I mean, a country that's so in desperate need. Yeah. <laughs> no, that can't happen. I mean, this is this is where you've got to get things right. Yeah. Um, I know that from a province, provincial point of view, what we've already looked at is, and I think that was a great question. I think we've already looked at the value chain, the supply chains, the, the logistics. I mean, you saw that initial uh, comment that we need to be at minus 70 degrees. Now, hmm. I mean, you know, these are very difficult, uh, uh, you know, supply chains yes. to be able to manage. The one thing that we do well in this province is we've got those value chains in the agricultural sector, although we're not at minus 80, we're yes. like at minus four or five degrees. Yeah. But at least it's in the system. So yeah. how do we work with it? And I'm also seeing that other manufacturers are not necessarily needing that kind of cold chain, should I yes. say it. 
So, but we're already asking those questions, looking at the logistics. Um, and obviously, this is where we do need to link uh, provincial and national. But, mm. but, we, but we definitely are looking at it. You know, how do we make sure that our most at risk get first? It's our frontline workers. We've got to look after our frontline mm. workers. And those that are at risk, those citizens that are at risk, um, you know, they've got to make sure that as soon as is possible, yeah. we need to get this in place. Yeah. Because it's also part of the recovery plan. If Absolutely. we don't get that right, we can't recover. Exactly. And we can't keep talking about lockdowns and as you know, because for me, those are short term strategies. Right. And, mm. and these are emergency short term strategies. As, as people have said, we've got to learn to live with this pandemic. And part of that is infusing a vaccine plan in the in the process. Correct. It's got to be the new normal. Mm. It's how we live our lives until that happens. Mm. Um, we all know what to do. So let's do that. And then let's allow recovery to take yeah. place. That's yeah. very, very important. Yeah. And that's where you allow innovation to come in. And we were really excited about innovation in our government over the last eight months. But also the innovation in private sector has just been mind blowing to me. And it's, you know, how do we get that balance right mm. as well mm. in the recovery space? Mm. Um, you know, where should government step back? and allow private sector to go ahead. And I mean, you know, we can talk a lot about uh, about innovation. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you mentioned the three-point plan. So the mm. three-point plan, part of the, mm. the discussion with the president in the PCC, the conversations we've been having with business, uh, with Minister Mkhize yesterday morning early. Uh, we've got a team in the garden read at the moment uh, looking at uh, those plans. It's about protecting the hospital system, quite simple, protect the hospital system. Mm -hmm. Use behavioural change and citizen partnership and citizen responsibility mm. to slow the virus. And then, as an, as an outside, you know, where that's not happening, then we will step in with law enforcement. Mm. And it's about joined up law enforcement like we used to see, remember the World Cup? Yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, we said thank you to the criminals because they all went away. But in actual <laughs> fact, people stood up. We made sure it was a linkage seamless between police and law enforcement and neighborhood watches and, you know, private sector security and beach patrols. And you name it. Yeah. They all came together. Let's make this safe. Citizens played their part. We quietened down crime. We can do it. But what we will do is if citizens aren't playing their role in helping us, the last thing any citizen wants is a lockdown. Yes. So then if you don't want a lockdown, just be responsible. Yeah. And we will we will come in with law enforcement where we have to. Mm. I'd prefer not to. I'd prefer to use law enforcement to fight crime. Mm. We need to make this place safe. But we will deploy uh, where people are not, yeah. uh, are not. And that's the three points. Let's get that right, simple, and let's move to recovery. Mm. And because ultimately, like you say, it's a partnership. I think South Africans need to understand that it's a partnership between government and themselves. You know, they play their part in being responsible citizens, while at the same time, government needs to play their part in getting the health system right. And that's why... We continue to ask the questions and hold government to account, particularly in provinces like the Eastern Cape, where we know that government has let the people down, where we know that national government and provincial governments in those places have let people down by not getting the health system jacked up. And it's good to hear, Alan, that we've got the systems in place. As you you said, you were on record saying, we've done this before, we can do it again. Yeah, we have. Uh, and of course, we didn't, you know, we dismantled our, our CTRCC response, mm. um, but we kept the R300 response in place. We, and, and then over and above that, uh, in, our, in our extra bed capacity, we then put permanent structures in place. Mm. So the Sornstroll Hospital, which is also then a decanting or a focus on COVID-19, uh, you know, almost called a feed hospital, but mm. that's a proper infrastructure. Mm. We put extra beds in place in our existing hospital structure. So we've got uh, two wards at Lentech here in Metals Plain that, that are uh, COVID-19 field hospitals, but they're actually permanent wards okay. because we also use this opportunity. It doesn't help. I remember initially, you know, uh, in, in early March talking about, are we going to put up tents with mm. beds in? Mm. You know, that's fine mm. if, for emergencies, but in actual fact, you know, if we want to help our system going yeah. forward yeah. and you're investing, make that investment last. Yeah. So, so those extra beds in those extra wards mm. are there for, you know, for any other ailment that we can look after you uh, in, the, in the health system going forward. And so yeah. it's about how you manage that investment, the best way to make it work. Uh, I mean, the last thing the last thing we need is to actually go backwards in this yeah. process. Yeah. The, this is about this is about moving forwards and learning. Yeah. We learn every single day. I mean, the innovation and the way we enabled innovation over the last eight months has changed the way we think about but, government. Yeah. You know, it, it normally takes eighteen months to pass a piece of legislation. Mm. Why? When we can build a hospital in six weeks. 
You know, yeah, <laughs> we, yeah. we need to rethink how, yeah. we, how we govern as well. No, absolutely. And, and Ellen, uh, before, because I want us to actually take a look at the story. Um, and I want to actually ask you about that because I think it's a magnificent thing that we saw happening in the province. So I want us to take a look at the story and I want to come back to you so you can tell us exactly about, you know, the Western Cape story and how we got there. But before we do, I, I mean, there, there is a lot of um, apprehension, uh, particularly around employers where people are saying, we want to keep our doors open. We want to continue employing people. We've had to let people go, but we still want to be able to contribute effectively. So, I mean, a lot of, a lot of apprehension in, in the business community who want to be employers in this province. And what are some of the things that we are thinking of doing or are doing to make sure that we assist them? In, and in what, what can they do as responsible employers too in yeah. the fight? Yeah, obviously. So, I mean, if we're talking COVID-19, it's mm. about playing your part in being a responsible business. Mm. I think a responsible business who puts mechanisms in place to carry on with business safely, mm. Mm. Uh, don't be that super spreader. Ask any business that has become a super spreader, your, your clients leave you. Mm. It doesn't make good business mm. sense. Mm. But then we've got to move to recovery. So yeah. recovery is about a new normal until a vaccine comes in. It's about thinking differently. Uh, I really celebrate those entrepreneurs that come up with great ideas. Um, we were talking about events, and and a big event that happens in our region is a is a a big cycle thing that happens every March. It's the biggest timed cycle race in the world. It's called the the, the Cape Town Cycle Tour. Um, it, it, and people around the world are jealous of it. Mm, uh, mm. I remember at one stage, London, I mean, they're really trying to beat us and they haven't managed to do it yet. <laughs> but, you know, that could be a couple of, you know, 35,000 people all yeah. congregating in one place. Yeah. It could become a super spreader. Yeah. So how does that company think differently? Yeah. So they've just run an event in Swellendam, which is a big economic driver for that town. Yeah. They thought about it differently. They used to have congregation, you know, beforehand, getting your entries, all that happened online now. Exactly. They used to have these, they used to have these briefing sessions, all the teams came together. That all happens online now. Yeah. Now you arrive. They also used to have the fast teams, the professionals would leave last. And, and it's 200 kilometers that you ride around the small towns of that region. And the slow teams go first. And the whole way the fast teams come past the slow teams. That wouldn't make good sense yeah. in COVID-19 yeah. times. Yeah. So they flicked it around. Yeah. And uh, so everyone, the faster guys went around, came through. They went through the chutes. They ended. They went home. Yeah. There was no congregation. It didn't become a spreader. That was innovation. Yeah. Now yeah. that event is now going to have a look at how they're going to run the Cape Town one. Yeah. So we can keep our doors open. We Absolutely. don't have to close these things down. We can open them. We can, and the same thing with business. Yeah. How does business innovate? I put out a challenge to say, you know, what gets me is that a restaurant will be congregated, packed, mm. people in there, uh, no masks. Obviously, mm. that's wrong. Mm. Um, but, but how do you know that it's full? Mm. And when you arrive, it's too late. Mm. And uh, so where are the app designers? And yeah. uh, I said this yesterday. Where are the app designers to say, there's a system that tells us this place is empty, this place is full, yes. so go there. Yes. And when that gets to 60% full or whatever, it says, hang on a second and... and the, Redirects you. Someone's already developed that. That's yeah. how cool our entrepreneurs are here. Yeah. And yeah. so they, they mailed me this morning, I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but you know, let's see how we can support these guys and get it out there and mm. let's find innovative ways that we, uh, we grow our economy. Mm. As a government, we're putting more and more money into it. Mm. We our our, uh, our recovery plan is about jobs and the economy. Yeah. Our recovery plan is also about safety because, yeah. of course, in our region you've got to be safe. We've yeah. got some parts of our region that really aren't safe, and we've it's, has been my mission from day one. Yeah. Focus on safety and then about dignity. Yeah. If you've lost your job and you can't feed your family, there's no dignity. Yeah. Absolutely. So you will see budget. We've just done our adjustment budget. Budget going into more uh, feeding scheme mechanisms, uh, making sure that we've got that dignity with that yeah. social net. Yeah. Uh, making sure we continue with safety and then all of this comes together in getting the jobs back that we've Because lost. a job is your way of getting dignity. Absolutely. Nothing now, Alan, I want us to take a look. Uh, earlier this year, the Western Cape was one of the first provinces to be hit by um, the pandemic where we had huge numbers. Um, and the Western Cape did something incredible where they turned what would have been a massive challenge into a massive opportunity to innovate and to really become the shining star in South Africa. Take a look. On the 5th of March, 2020, 
South Africa's first COVID-19 case was confirmed. A few days later, the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus outbreak a pandemic. The Western Cape government had been planning and putting measures in place before the first case was diagnosed and stepped up to the challenge of defeating the coronavirus and saving livelihoods. The DA-led government rolled out intense community screening, education and testing, prioritizing vulnerable patients who are most at risk from the virus. All regional and district hospitals were set up to admit COVID-19 patients, and all provincial healthcare facilities could test and diagnose. Special facilities were set up to increase hospital capacity for the expected peak. For example, the CTICC Convention Center was transformed into the largest field hospital in Africa in just six weeks and helped more than 1,500 patients while it was open. The Red Dot Taxi Initiative was created to take care of the hard-working healthcare workers, transporting nurses to and from work safely and on time, carrying over 70,000 passengers to date. In partnership with Uber, 700,000 parcels of chronic medication have been delivered to patients' homes. 53 million rand was allocated towards helping vulnerable residents have a decent meal during the hard lockdown. This included distributing food parcels and cooked meals and running a special school feeding program while learners were at home. Initiatives such as the Western Cape COVID-19 Business Relief Fund committed 27 million rand to supporting small businesses in both the formal and informal sectors which have been hard hit by COVID-19 restrictions. While other provinces were plagued by wide-scale corruption, the Western Cape Provincial Government shared all the details of their COVID-19 protective work gear procurement with the public. Where we govern, we will continue to put residents first, working hard to save lives and livelihoods. incredible story and I saw their professor um, Karim essentially saying that the province has really led the way in terms of being able to roll out a proper health response even though they were the first to be hit hardest by um, by by the rising infections and so this didn't come without a plan and it didn't come without a lot of learning and so Alan I'd love for you to tell me a little bit more about what went into that incredible achievement. So of course you always uh, you always hear about those those great big stories, which are the you know the medicines that are delivered to people's homes, we can't slip back on that now. I mean, mm -hmm. we always remember people queuing from early in the morning outside the clinic. You know, now they get delivered at home. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't slip back. Uh, you know, the the red dot red dot taxi system getting nurses. You know, more than one hundred and ten thousand nurse trips have happened already. Mm -hmm. those, those innovations happen, but you know, there's even innovations within innovations. And for me, the most exciting was that it actually. It wasn't, uh, you know, I sat in the cabinet saying, we will now do this. Um, it was actually coming up from the people that work in our departments, the people that work in government here. We've got 87,000 people that work in the government, from teachers to nurses. They were on the front line. And then, of course, all the back office people. And I'll never forget, the first field hospital was in Kailicha. It mm -hmm. was a partnership, Medicine Sans Frontiers, ourselves, the city. It was at the Tusong Center. It became this uh, next to the Kailich Hospital, it became this field hospital. And uh, we were doing the official opening. We invited the national minister. Um, we, we were doing the official opening on the Tuesday and on the Saturday. I thought, well, let me just go and double check that we're ready. Mm. And I did a surprise visit and I walked in. And uh, these, are the, these are the little stories. It's, I walked in and I saw this lady walking around with a laptop on her one arm and other stuff in her other arm. And she's like very busy. And I can see <laughs> the beds are out and the doctors are there. So I go up to her and I say, hi, ma'am, uh, what are you busy doing? 
And she looks at me and she says to me, Premier, I work in your department. <laughs> and I go, oh, really, I'm sorry, uh, which one? And she said, oh, I work in the IT department. I said, great, so what are you doing here? She said, we were sitting at the office and we thought, hang on a second, these hospitals shouldn't just be these field hospitals, they should all be connected, have Wi-Fi connectivity. Mm -hmm. And here my whole team is, and there they were up ladders, they weren't getting in contractors or getting in public works, they themselves are up the ladders, drilling in the walls, putting the Wi-Fi routers in, um, so the next thing, this field hospital had more tech than the hospital. Oh, man. Uh, you know, x-rays were coming to the tablet at the end of the bed. Mm. The patient was getting a, a mobile phone to speak to their family because they couldn't visit them. Mm. This happened organically mm. from unbelievable people in our system. Mm. And there are just hundreds of these kind of stories where mm. people just stood up mm. and made a difference. Mm. And we can't reverse that now. That's no, that, exactly. I mean, that kind of tech is now going back into the hospitals. Yeah. and. So that's how you get better and yeah. how you learn. And I mean, I could tell you so many of these yeah, stories, but yeah. I celebrate those men and women in our government who really stood up, yeah. made a difference. They were counted. They backed up those frontline workers mm. like you cannot believe. And those are the great stories. And that's inspiring, Alan. And, and I'm so glad you mentioned the fact that now we can't lose that. We can't lose the innovations that we had put up during this crisis. We now have to feed it into the system. That's how we actually get to effectively improving our health mm. system for the millions of South Africans who depend on it. And so I, I do want to then touch on this, you know, because during our lockdown in the Western Cape, we lost about 300,000 jobs. That's 300,000 households, 300,000 and even more people who are affected by, um, um, you know, such a lockdown. Ultimately, the rest of the world also went through a pandemic and we've seen devastating effects of it. And I just want to give you an opportunity to perhaps, you know, to talk to the people of the Western Cape about you know, we still have the lowest unemployment rate um, despite this. And so I would like you to, to talk to them about what are some of the things that we're wanting to do in this next festive season? What can they do to keep safe so that we can keep out the doors of our businesses open? Yeah, so absolutely. So in actual fact, we lost 321,000 jobs. Mm. Um, 321,000 jobs. At the end of this year, it should have come down, we estimate, to about 150,000 jobs. Wow. So that means we're already clawing back. Yeah. Now, of course, another lockdown would absolutely reverse that. We mm. cannot afford another lockdown. Mm. So we're already clawing back on the economy. Mm. We're playing our part. We're getting businesses alongside. We're putting extra funding into enabling. You, you saw in the inset um, the 51 million for, for uh, food relief. Yeah. You saw 27 million rand for small business relief. Yeah. We've just added another 11 or 12 million for the small business relief. We put another 50 million or 51 million into food relief. We've got a donation uh, in the city of Cape Town from the German government. Uh, there's another nearly 100 million going into food relief. Mm. Put into vouchers. Those vouchers are going to be used by small businesses. So you don't get a food parcel, you get a voucher. You go down to the end of the road yes. and you buy your provision from the small business at the mm. end of the road. So at the same time, you're helping someone with food, but you're supporting a small yeah. business. And, and you give them the choice. Correct, but yeah. that's getting things going again. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we've got to do. We've, yeah. We understand that this virus is still with us. Mm. We, we will do everything in our power mm. to make sure that uh, we will continue to flatten the curve, but at the same time, we cannot afford another lockdown. Mm. We will make sure that we play our part. We will yeah. do whatever is necessary yeah. to flatten this curve. We will continue with making sure we've got enough beds, enough oxygen, enough etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But we need citizens to play their part because yeah. if citizens don't play their part, well then what happens is you overpower the, yeah. the health system. Yeah. Um, you destroy the economy in this mm. process. We've got to find that balance. And quite frankly, right now, it's about recovery. Mm. So keep make make the lessons we learned during COVID-19 a habit. Mm. You know? Yeah. This is a habit for yeah. now. Yeah. We, talk, we spoke about vaccines. Yeah. Between now and the vaccines, here's your yeah. habit. Yeah. Just make it a habit. Yeah. Um, here's the other habit. Yes. Um, there are a number of them. This, yeah. this is a habit. You exactly. Know? I'm, exactly. A, I'm, a, I'm a hugging person. <laughs> it's been terrible for the last nine months. Yeah. I can't hug people anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, those are the habits. Unfortunately, keep those habits. Let's get the recovery going. Yeah. Let's focus on that recovery and let's keep lockdown out of the way. Yeah. We don't want a lockdown. Yeah. We want a growing economy. Um, you know, we, we are proud that we have got the highest unemployment, uh, the, the lowest, lowest unemployment, unemployment rate, yeah. the highest employment rate in our country, the highest uh, absorption rate. Um, we got all of those numbers, but mm. even those numbers are too high. Yeah. And this lockdown has actually made them worse. 
We've got to claw it back. Yeah. We've got to find opportunities for those small businesses. We've got to make sure those people sitting at home get the opportunity to get out. We're focusing at the moment on ECDs. Mm. We're putting lots of extra funding into ECDs at the moment because we are told you earlier that the statistics show us that women, specifically black rural women, mm. are the ones that are the worst off yeah. after this pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. How do we get people to get back the opportunity to go and look for a job yeah. if they're held captive? They haven't got the money to take their child to an ECD. Perhaps that ECD hasn't got the opportunity to open because they don't have the PPE in place. Yeah. Yeah. So we definitely are focusing. How do we enable those ECDs? Because by doing that, you're also enabling the economic. Yeah. How, do you, how do you enable through cutting red tape? Mm making it easier. How do we attract foreign direct investment? Mm. The investment around the world at the moment is looking at various countries on mm. what you're doing. We're saying in our region, bring your dollars, mm. bring your euros, bring your yen, whatever it is, mm. bring it here because we've got the right place to invest. And, and we will make sure ultimate. that it is invested well and it is, and it is protected like this German funding. Correct. We will make sure that it goes to the right things. Yes. So, Alan, thank you so much. Thank you to the work that you and your government are doing. But also thank you to the thousands of employees who work in this province, like you said, who are the backbone of this province and who've made this possible. Thank you so much uh, for the work that you do. Thank you. And now we are going to be uh, looking back at what we have in store for you next week. That's a wrap, Mzans Africa. We will be back next week to give you the inside track on what's really happening in our nation. In this age of fake news and information overload, we are committed to helping you cut through the noise and get to the hearts of what's really happening in South Africa today. Send your comments and your voice notes to the show hotline on 63 181-0059 reflecting on what you think about the news of the week. Until then, follow the DA on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram and YouTube and keep up to speed with all the breaking news you need to know as it happens. Until then, keep it tidy Mzansi.